Hi, everybody. Hey, welcome Hello. to Cinephilia, uh, your weekly, we, what did it say? Weekly dose of entertainment news? We'll get something better. Uh, that works. That works. Uh, yeah, we are back. And uh, we're going to talk about today about um, Mad Max Fury Road. Because it's. Yeah, it's the five year anniversary. So five year I'm excited anniversary. to talk about it. It's been already five years since it came out. Already, like that, it's it feels like it's still so new. But I, I rewatched it last night, and yeah, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's been up for five years, and it's still so good. Yeah, and I think it, it made me think of things that I hadn't thought. Well, I guess I thought about it, but maybe things that are happening around right felt more relevant. Um, which we'll yeah, get in, we'll that's get into. really funny because it came out in 2015. It's uh -huh. 2020 now. This movie came out in 2015, and it kind of predicted a lot of what's happened yeah i mean not not in very specific terms but generally thematically like, there's a few things in there that i'm yeah, like i'm i feel so more funny. aware of now yeah um but yeah let's uh but let's get started with the news all right in the news did you have yours now open is it good ready to go i did have it open <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. oh yes i do have it open actually it's okay. right here cool um so the first thing is this was breaking news just earlier today actually. Okay. Um Scream Five is confirmed. Yeah. We're making another Scream movie. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and David Arquette. There there have been rumors of Scream Five happening already, but um it's now been confirmed and David Arquette is definitely returning as Dewey, the um the the cop. The, so Okay. I mean, that, that was the breaking news from earlier today. I mean, that's. I mean, it was a pretty su successful franchise. There's a lot of fans, and it knows it's kind of bad and it's cheesy and fun. So I, I, it, I guess it's fine. But did we need another one? They're not the 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 last one. Part four was not the best. I, the first three I love, um, but they're also not. They're not the best horror movies, but they do have a nice little niche that i like and that they're the horror movies that explain horror movies i like yeah, when yeah. we get movies that explain the genre and it's kind of meta um and that's what scream is for the horror genre so i i kind of tongue-in-cheek like it um i think they like you said they know what they are and they can yeah. you know they can like hardliner hardliner says he hopes it's uh they hope it's filmed on zoom <laughs> that'd be funny um, I mean, it'd be, it'd be fitting if they keep going and, you know, what horror movies are, then we're getting like horror movies like Unfriended now, so they can spoof on that. Um, was the, um, Reedish Cooper says, wait, was for the one that didn't actually feel like a screen film where the cousin is crazy? Yes, that was that was four. That four is the one that came years after when people had long forgotten screen. Yeah. I mean, I think I only saw one. I might have half watched part two but one was the only one i watched uh, part the one first three are I good, the movie they, they're part two you if you only half watch part two that's upsetting because um i think my favorite villain is in part two. Oh, okay but, <laughs> yeah, I don't remember part two. of the scream franchise part um, one was only, only memorable to me because i sat in the movie theater and it was like the first one that came out it was kind of a big deal or whatever and also awkwardly my girlfriend new girlfriend ex-boyfriend drove us to the movie theater which is really weird oh that's a different story for another time um yeah, that sounds like your own drama that you should be that writing was, the movie about. <laughs> it was high school it was fine don't remember much um cool so i found a, i found an article that i just uh, on the news that I found kind of interesting. It's not necessarily news, but it happened this week. So uh, yeah. Comic Book, the website Comic Book, uh, kind of let fans um, kind of speak out on, uh, about Anna de Armas, which Who we we, bo love. we both love, yeah. And and, and yeah. ask ask their their twi Twitter what they thought some good comic book casting would be for her. So uh, okay. it, there's a few. So this uh, isn't like official. No, no, like no. She's been cast. This is just people speculating. People speculating what they would like to see. It, it was like, like you know, fan casting. But I thought it was interesting um, because uh, and so the, here are the, the most popular answers. Uh, one of the first okay. ones was Poison Ivy. Okay. Which I could see that. I could see that. Uh, Jean Grey. I can see that. M Mystique. Batgirl. So we're going with. For some reason, we're going with all redheads. I guess. 
Yeah, so far. <laughs> Mystique, so she's yeah. She's not even a redhead, but that's Bat- interesting. Batgirl, who is sometimes a redhead. Doc Ock. Yeah. I don't know. Doc and- Ock. <laughs> and... That's so random. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's because I think in Spider Verse that she's the girl now. She's she was female in Spider Verse, so I think right. That... And I love that version of Doc Ock, but that's just such a rare. It's weird. Like someone actually put in their head, put together uh, that Doc Ock would be. That's strange. Yeah, <laughs> and the last one was Zatanna. Okay, which is I'm fine. I think the only one that I'm actually kind of like. I'd like it would be maybe Poison Ivy or Batgirl. I think Batgirl. I would like her as Batgirl. I think of the ones you've named, I think Batgirl would be the best. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and she's actually in this article. She's standing next to a comic book version of Batgirl. And I'm like, I could see that. Yeah, yeah. I can totally see her as Batgirl. Uh, Rage Cooper says, I'm not familiar with the actress. She was the lead in um, Knives Out. Knives Out. And she's going to be. And she in- was also in um, the the latest Blade Runner. She's the the hologram girl that follows yeah. Ryan Gosling around. And she's going to be in the new James Bond movie. Is she? I didn't realize yeah, that. She's in. She's a new, she's a new Bond, Bond girl. girl. Yeah, and she's only been speaking English for like three years. <laughs> I learned. You don't have to speak English to be a Bond girl. No, I mean like she's doing movies in America and English. She's she only learned how to speak English oh, like okay. three years ago. That's pretty cool. I'm yeah, the, the very first movie that I ever saw her in was um, that movie that we, <laughs> it came up, I don't remember how it came up a couple episodes ago, but the movie Knock Knock with Keanu Reeves, oh. where two girls show up at his doorstop, she's one of the girls in it, and she actually, like, in that, even though the movie was awful, because it's Eli Roth, yeah. um, she is eye-catching, and and. Visually, like she's beautiful, but I mean, eye catching in that she also commands the screen. Like she's a great oh, yeah. performer, and that's she's the... a great actress. Yeah. Um. So even in that, I was like, mm, I want to see where where this goes with her career. Um. British Cooper says she. So has... I'm glad that she's doing well. British Cooper says she has a really thick accent. I don't. I. I, I mean, I'm. I'm. Not, I'm implying inflection. I don't know what he meant by that, but I'm fine with it. I like it. I think it's cool. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm Ooh, everything about, I've seen her in, she's been great. She's amazing. Mm-hmm. What about White Tiger so, for her in terms of how, uh, let's have people play their roles? What? Oh, she has been seen around with Ben Affleck. Weird. Yeah, she is dating Ben Affleck. Uh, well, that's that's that's, that's unfortunate. That's, but but if we're just focusing on her acting career, then she's great. She can do whatever she wants with her personal life. We're not we're not focusing on her her <laughs> choice in men. <laughs> All right, what do you got? Uh, Fred Willard, who is amazing, yeah. has died. Um, I love Fred Willard, so I, it's one that I'm really sad about. Um. But yeah, he was like he's the first first live action actor in a Pixar movie, <laughs> which I think oh, is funny. Oh, that's right. And he's also in in all of the Christopher Guest mockumentaries. Yeah. He's just a really funny guy. He's the first um, and only, right? As far as I know. Yeah. Yeah, the first and only. Yeah. Uh that's really sad too cuz I really liked him. Um and he was he was I mean, he was like he was 86, right? And he was yeah. working nonstop all the way till like yeah he's yeah. still working. In fact, he is in that um, Space Force show that's supposed to be on Netflix next year or later this year. So he's been working like nonstop. Yeah, and I mean, literally, and, and as a Bachelor fan um, or watcher, um, you can say fan. Just no, I just it. I want to see that it's great. It's just entertaining. Anyways, <laughs> uh, other conversation. Um, he was on there. He's almost there in every season. He shows up. On one episode, he just he shows up as an announcer for whatever random thing they're doing. Uh, he was always on The Bachelor, which is really cute because he's super old and he's super funny. Um, yeah, so it's really sad that he is passed away. That's funny that he's always on The Bachelor. I never would have known that information. I never would have known. <laughs> Bexver says stream went choppy because Will chopped his pigtails. Oh, I I still have all my hair. It's just braided. It's just... I have. I'm Pippi Longstocking now, and it's all it's just out of the way. back behind my ear. But all the hair is still there. There's so much hair. Nothing got cut off and at nothing, all. Nothing got chopped. The beard just keeps getting longer. Beard keeps getting longer. 
Um, I'm, I, I'm fine with, with hair. I So I'm working on the beard, and I'm still on the fence about it. I think it looks good. I think you should do it. You should keep it. I am working on it. Just, it's getting, you know, it's just a lot of maintenance. Um, <laughs> it used to be just like chop, 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 safe, done. Now I'm like, okay, go here. And I'm like, oh, too much. Uh, no, well, that's why you just grow it. You don't have to keep it even. Well, <laughs> just grow it all out, brush it, and, and keep it neat. It bothers me to have like neck beard. Like, I, when oh, I see, see it yeah, I know me. a lot of people have that problem, but mine actually grows in a way that's just perfect it doesn't go down to my neck oh so i don't have that problem thankfully oh thanks reach versus the beard actually looks really good on you everybody keeps saying that See, <laughs> amber agrees in the background um next in the news which is really funny because I, I can't wait to see how this pans out so apparently the uh, comic book nerds everywhere are getting really upset at the fact that robin, robin pattinson refuses to work out while he's in quarantine <laughs> because <laughs> like he's supposed to you know he doesn't know when he's going back to f- 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 keep filming on batman and um he's not working out like all like i think he it was an, uh, in the article I don't know if it's this article a different one i read um he had spoken to zoe kravitz and asked her what she was doing and she was still working out she was like had a had a thing she's gonna be catwoman and she's but he's just kind of being robin pattinson and just kind of hanging out and not working out which i mean i don't blame him because it's hard to keep motivated but he but do you, at the same time do you time, actually believe that that's true because robert pattinson has a history of trolling the press which will be I funny just, that's true i think he was just saying stuff to like to stir things stir the pot yeah and so he did because and nerd, it is really funny so but this at the same time uh, apparently he had t- he had issues with um with bulking up like he he they put him on a diet and then like they were working him hard and he his body's just not the type that bulks up so he wasn't really, yeah. I don't think he really needs to work out that much because he was already not going to be, you know, a big buff Batman. He's going to be sort of a thinner Batman. Just yeah. fine. And for this to be like a year one type of Batman where yeah. he's young and inexperienced, Might it kind of fits. Like you got to start somewhere. So if Robert Pattinson wants to be the skinny Batman, I'm. it works for me. It's fine. Yeah. Reese Cooper says... He shouldn't need to bulk up. Michael Keaton was fine. People loved him. Yeah, Michael Keaton was that's, a... That's true. And he was, he was like 5'2", Batman. So, and everyone, <laughs> nobody cared. And he was great. <laughs> All so. the muscles were in the suit. Uh, Rich Cooper ever says, uh, the anger's over it. It's so dumb. Yeah, it is really dumb. I just thought it was really funny. Because um, I want to see how yeah, I want to see how funny. pans out. I, I, I've grown, really grown to love Robert Pattinson. I did not <laughs> like him uh, at first, but... His his movies, his acting, and his personality have really won me over. Yeah, he's funny. What else you got? I got. Um, there's some Disney Plus news. Do you want to do it? Since you usually are. No, you do the Disney Plus. Disney you're you're the big Plus fan stuff. of Disney Plus. Am I? <laughs> so Disney Plus has officially announced a Percy Jackson series. Remind me. Did who, you hear about that? I did. I just don't remember who Percy Jackson is. They they were like, is this like the Harry Potter wannabe? Yeah. Yes, okay. but I I feel like there were two movies. There was at least uh, yeah. one movie, but Didn't it they might do? have been two. I'm pretty sure they two. did the movies. Yeah. Um, and I think like Uma Thurman was Medusa in one of them or something like that. Um, like the Medusa. But anyway, the the series has a big fan following, so a lot oh, of people okay. are excited about it. I've never read the series. I've not seen either of the Percy Jackson movies. And I'm also not the biggest fan of Disney Plus, so that's why I was trying to get you to do this news. <laughs> but but there's some news there. If you're a fan of, of Percy Jackson, there's a series coming mm. to Disney Plus. Yeah, I really not know anything about Percy Jackson. I just remember go, happening after Harry Potter and it feeling like they were trying to bank on Harry Potter. But I don't know the I don't know which came first in the book world i don't know which no yeah i meant the movies when i saw the movies come out they felt like the movies were definitely the movies definitely cashed in on the popularity of harry potter um yeah all right next to the news this is not much news but just a reminder avatar the last airbender is on netflix go watch it if you haven't watched it watch it we need to do a a episode on yeah that that might have to be a round table episode oh that'd be good Uh, yeah get danny on it yeah um so uh, if you haven't watched it, please watch it. If you have watched it, watch it again and again and again. 
Uh, we Amber and I watched. We skipped season one and just started with season two. And we watched most season two and three in like a day. Uh, it was just playing in the background all day. Um, yeah, I'm gonna jump. That was short, so I'm gonna jump into the next one. So, um, so you know how Wait, is that is is the next one Netflix related? Because I have two Netflix related news. Oh no, go ahead. Go. To, let's go to Netflix related. You mentioned Netflix. So Netflix has bought um the Eric Andre comedy Bad Trip, which was supposed to be out in theaters. This year, um, which it's going to be on Netflix, which is good because I was looking forward to it. It's have you did you see the trailer for this? I think I did, but I'm trying to remember what it is. I remember the name. It's, so it's Eric Andre starring as this guy who has to um, drive cross country, and okay. it's it's got a plot, but it's also like a jackass movie where they're pulling pranks on. Oh, okay, on yeah, yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. A, there's a plot, but they're shooting this plot live in public spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Tiffany Haddish is also in it. Okay. Um, and they're just they're they're pranking they're pulling these pranks in front of people and getting people's reactions yeah. as he drives cross country. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it looks like it could be really funny. Yeah, yeah, I did see the trailer for that. Yeah, and Reed H. Cooper reminds us that Lovebirds is going to be on Netflix Friday. on Friday, which is another movie yes. that was supposed to come out this year, and Netflix bought up. I'm excited to um, see that. And then the the other Netflix news piece that I have is that Netflix is adapting. The Grudge into a series as well. Oh, which the the new there was a new Grudge movie that came out earlier this year that was <laughs> awful. It was the worst of any Grudge thing that has ever come out. Um, and so this news, like to to hear it at first, I'm thinking we don't need more Grudge right now. No. But the plus side is that this Grudge series is um, a Japanese production. Okay, so it'll go back. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll go back to feeling more like the original Juon that the Grudge is based on. So, <laughs> Reed Cooper says, but it had John Cho's butt. Will Cho's butt. <laughs> it wasn't in it enough. <laughs> There's still the rest of the movie surrounding his butt. <laughs> Just give me a picture of the butt, and it's better than the movie. <laughs> oh, that's fun. When is that coming out? Did they say, or is it just... Um, they just announced that they're adapting it, so I don't think they have a set time yet. Cool. All right. Uh, my next piece of news, I found an article about uh, Miyazaki's new movie, because remember, he retired, and then he was like, never mind, I'm not retired. <laughs> he retired, and it came out, and then retired again, and it came out, and then retired again. Yeah. He keeps going back and forth. So apparently, they're working on it, but they're working on it super tediously and slow. Apparently, in the three years that this movie has been in production, they have finished 36 minutes of movie. And not because they're not trying or not because they're short on people. Uh, the older movies had about 30 people, there, two animators. Apparently, they have 60 animators on this. And they're only able to pump out um, uh, 12 a minute, a minute of, of, of footage per month. So they're on three years, so they're at 36 minutes of footage that they've done. So they, they're looking at another three years to work on this movie. But you know what that means is this movie is going to be so visually immaculate. Yeah, because I think they're they're <laughs> also. Worth, do- I think it's going to be worth the wait. I'm willing to wait for it. Yeah, I'm willing to wait for it too. So Miyazaki State it doesn't die and he's healthy and because I know he's old, but um, it's going to be interesting. And because apparently they might be doing higher frame rate than normally. They might be doing full twenty four, right. which is what I'm guessing right. why it's taking so long. Because uh, a lot of movies, especially older movies, they 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 did like fifteen frames or twelve frames per second. And I'm going to guess because they're going hard on this. They're shooting 24 frames on this one. I wonder if they have, um, it might be that they only have 36 minutes finished, but they have so much, like if they went through the whole movie doing like keyframes already or something like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. then the 36 minutes is all they have, like the in-betweens done for or something like that. Yeah, I think it's um, 36 it minutes. might be something that it won't take as long to do the rest of it as it did to do the beginning part, if that makes sense. Yeah, so maybe some of the work, some of the background, some of that stuff. So, But in the article, it did state that they think it's going to take another three years. Okay. But uh, Vexper says, out of curiosity, I wonder how long Spider-Verse took. I think usually CG movies like that take about two or three years. Yeah. Um, is what they take. That sounds about right. Uh, some I mean, of, from, from like beginning production. Production to, to the end, yeah, to the end. end. Yeah. I mean, other movies like Angry Birds probably take a lot shorter time. Um, <laughs> you know stuff like that. Angry Birds two. I just want to say Angry Birds two 
Um, the whole movie didn't quite work for, for me, but have you seen it? No, I have Are, not. There, there's a moment, and it's in the trailer, but um, but the scene is longer in the actual movie. But there's a moment where the birds are infiltrating this this place and they're all dressed in this giant eagle costume Uh um and that character of them all in the giant eagle costume that eagle is so funny like (laughs) the the comedy of it is so on point um and the rest of the movie i could take it or leave it but i love that that eagle costume scene especially when he goes into the bathroom too it's pretty funny (laughs) um and my, uh, I have two more pieces of news. Um, how much? How I much? I have a couple more pieces. Okay, cool. So this is all rumor, and I'm I I got I gotta be honest. I'm a giant Star Wars fan, and I love Star Wars fan, and I don't remember. You I th- are. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's I don't know. I keep it quiet. Um, <laughs> and I don't ever remember. You know when people say like, um, oh, you know, when I watched Star Wars movie, it changed my life, or it, like it became a fan. It's like I don't ever remember not having Star Wars in my life. There's never a time when I don't remember. It was just, I don't remember the first time I saw it. It just was. I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't remember the first time I saw it either. It's just one of those things. Like it was always on TV. It was just always there. It was, yeah, it was always a part of my life. Yeah. You know? That being true. said, I'm kind of tired of Star Wars at the moment. I'm a little. I'm a little Star Wars out. Welcome. Um, <laughs> Welcome. Join me. Welcome to the dark side. And I, I think I fully realized that today when I uh, uh, this week when I was looking for news, like actively looking for news to talk about. And there was so much Star Wars news. Like, like I love the shows that are coming, coming, and they're I'm, I'm excited for those. But just generally hearing about Star Wars nonstop is getting a little tiring. Uh, yeah. And so, except I did find one nugget that I was kind <laughs> of excited about today to bring it back. Okay, what is it? Uh, and it could go either way. But now there's rumors. There's still rumors, and nothing, nothing announced that uh, there's a Ahsoka series rumored for Disney Plus. Is it going to be live action? Uh, live action, animated? yeah. So, so Rosario Dawson. So uh, yeah, so the the whole idea that Rosario Dawson is going to be a Mandalorian might not be just a um, a one time thing. She might it might actually be setting her up for her own. Um, I mean, series. She's a big she's a big enough character to handle her own show. Obviously, yeah, she yeah. Basically, had her own show before, um, and but it it is astounding that she is such a big character who is not really gotten that that huge spotlight yeah yeah and, and she needs so it. i i can see it happening like i don't i'm honestly it's kind of like the black widow thing where it's like what took so long, What's to so long? yeah even realized you could do this and with somebody like rosario dawson who can you know do it and then have is the recognizable name i think it would be watchable um there it, it's so uh, so this article says it would also fall in line with reports of a female-led series from Russian doll sh- showrunner Leslie Headland. So um, uh, so they, they kind of put two and two together. They know that there's rumors that there's a female-led series that she's going to be working on for Disney+, Plus, and then this kind of popped up. So there's a good chance that um, maybe... I didn't realize a- that um, the creator of Russian Doll was working on it. Did you watch that on Netflix? I did not know. It's a, it's a great show, and yeah. it's a real short show. Like, you can get through it real quick, mm-hmm. but... Um, it's it's worth the watch. Okay. If you have not seen Russian Doll, definitely watch it. I'm being it's yelled really at. Good. Watch it, Art, says Reach <laughs> Cooper. Also, Vexper says, can I have your Star Wars collectibles then, Art? No, no. I'm tired of <laughs> hearing about Star Wars. I'm just not tired of Star Wars. Well, it's, I mean, it is tiring because if you look up the any kind of entertainment movie news, right now it's all either about Star Wars or about the MCU. Yeah. Those are the things that really are just dictating movie news right now. Yeah. Um, everything else is kind of like <laughs> not happening. Everything else seems like it's taking a break, but those two things are just like pushing through. Yeah. So I get you. Yeah. All right. I have one more thing. I have, I have a couple more things. Okay. Um, I'll let you go. AMC network has acquired the rights to Anne Rice's literary works. So they're going to be working on uh, new shows for um, the Mayfair Witches and the her Vampire Chronicles, which could be interesting. All right. I'm, I, I'm a big Anne Rice fan, so okay. I, yeah, I, I would love to it. see 
some better interpretations of those works. Um, British Cooper says monk reunion on Peacock. Is there a monk reunion happening? Because that would be exciting. I would watch that. The mummy, not the mummy. I have no idea what that meant. meant by that. <laughs> oh, it already happened. The monk reunion already happened. What did I miss? When did I miss this? I've told you were that. too busy streaming. I was too busy streaming. Oh, Anne Rice is the mummy. I don't know if they. What I saw was only um, talking about the Mayfair Witches and Vampire Chronicles. So I don't know if they're actually doing um, her mummy book or not. Maybe. Maybe. Um, cool. All right. My last bit of news, which is actually my last bit of news because I think it's a little more exciting than the Ahsoka series. Um so apparently the Gargoyles, the Disney Gargoyles, the cartoon from the 90s, uh, creator wants to work with uh, Jordan Peele on a live action movie of Gargoyles. Which makes perfect sense yep. because Jordan Peele years ago said that he wanted to make a live action Gargoyles. Yeah, and this is kind of where um, where he came, that came from. He says he's not speaking from any no knowledge of knowing anything. He just knows that at some point Jordan Peele approached Disney about the Gargoyles franchise and Disney didn't say no. But they also didn't say yes. So the, it was just kind of like they were like, okay, interesting. And so they, at least Disney is kind of open to, to the idea of it. Uh, they didn't shut it down. So he's hoping that maybe something would happen. But don't know. It, it, it kills me sometimes the decision-making process that uh, these big producers and corporations make. Because there are so many things that are just readily available to be made. And that people want and creators with talent want to make. And for some reason, they take forever to either possibly get made or just not get made at all. Oh, yeah. um, and then at the same time, we just get all this crap that no one really <laughs> wants. Like, we didn't need a new Lady in a Tramp <laughs> live action remake. <laughs> but why are you, why why? Are you taking your time on, on the, the Gargoyles thing that Jordan Peele and the creator of Gargoyles want to do? And fans are rabid about Gargoyles content. Mm -hmm. Like it's a huge cult following. And right now, the why is this not like an easy thing to decide? Yeah. And right now, the people who go to the movies are the people who watched those cartoons in the 90s. So this is the perfect right. time to make it because we will go see right. it. Right. Exactly. This is, a, a, we don't need, <laughs> we don't need a live action, whatever else they're working on <laughs> that um, no one asks for. Yeah. No. Um, and the, this is what people are asking for, and they don't. They just want to tiptoe on it. And then ch uh, the chat's already casting the movie. British Cooper says Michael Dorn or Riot. And Deadly Night Chase <laughs> says Keith David or Riot. I think both of those were good choices. So, my last bit of news. Um, tell me if you know more about this than I do, because I only have seen this one article about it. Okay. But there's a new Sesame Street CG series in the works Wait, where the what? Sesame Street characters are mecha robots that build things. Uh, no, and I there's, hadn't. There's, a, there's, the, there's an image with this article of Cookie Monster who looks kind of like Iron Man, but is Cookie Monster um, holding up a cookie. And it's actually really cute. And I have no idea where this came from or why it's happening, but the idea of Sesame Street characters being you know, futuristic robots, but still like teaching about building and stuff like that. It's kind of cool. I, I can kind of see it. Wow. Have you good. heard anything about that? No, I have let not. Me, let me send you this picture real quick so okay. you can see it. Maybe you can post it for the the, the group. Because it, it's kind of awesome. Did you get it? I just texted it to you. Um, there it is. Oh, okay. He's cute. He's cute. Not I don't. Me. That's the only picture I've seen. I don't know um, how I'm the sure. other characters will look, but it's on screen right now for the for our, our friends. I'm gonna put it up here. Um. Okay, that was less weird than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> it, right. Just reading about it, it it sounds pretty weird, but. I can, I can, like, I, I don't know what kind of plot points the show would have, or if it's like a 30 minute episode show or 15 minute episode show for little kids or something yeah. like that. But 
I'm just them flying around or building stuff. I could see it being really simple and working. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the character is really cute. That's interesting. I'm gonna have to look more um more more about it. I have to check it out. It's it's a very random idea, but it might it might be just random enough to work. <laughs> All right, I'll try it. Yeah, I think it, that might be cute. All right, you want to get on to the the main topic? The main topic. Yeah, the main topic. You guys, it's the five year anniversary of Mad Max already. I can't believe it. That time like flew. Um, I yeah, do. when we did our like. What were you about to say something? I was I was gonna say just I remember when it was first announced and I was like I don't know how you why or how you'd make another Mad Max like it'd been so long that I was not I was kind of not convinced I was like well we'll see and it was a very different uh it I got, it got way more than I expected which is cool well I guess I kind of had the same reaction when it was first announced because I did not like the first three Mad Max movies when they originally came out mm-hmm. or when I saw them as a kid because mm-hmm. that's how long ago it was. Mm-hmm. Um, I had, I think I may have told the story on Cinephilia before, but it seems like a good way to, to intro the show. Um, we had a very, very early VCR when I was little. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my mom would go rent movies um, every weekend after work. She would go to the video store, rent a movie and bring it back. And usually because I was a kid and I was the only kid in the house, there would be movies for me. So it was like my treat. (laughs) Um, And she, that's when I saw movies like the first, the original Charlotte's web or like follow that bird, like, Mm -hmm. like fun kitty stuff like that. Although both of those movies have very dark sides to them, (laughs) but fun kitty stuff like that. Um, And then one weekend, my mom brought home Mad Max because my dad had requested it and wanted to see it. And I was like, this is not a movie for me. What the fuck is this? <laughs> so I sat down and watched Mad Max with my dad. And it just, obviously, I was too young. It went right over my head. Um, and so for years, like, my dad loved it. And he ended up getting the, you know, all the movies at some point to watch. Um, so I had seen them, but I did not enjoy them. Um And they just stuck in my head as the movies that my dad loved, um, but that I didn't like. Like that was that was the stigma that I had about Mad Max for most of my life growing up. And so when this new one was announced, I was like, "Really, Mad Max? Like that is trash." (laughs) Is what I was thinking. Um, But then when they said that there would be Tom Hardy, that was the first click for me. It was like, "Okay, Tom Hardy's in it. I'm obviously going to go see it." Because I love Tom Hardy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being like the crazy person that I am that has to watch everything in order, I was like, well, if this is actually going to be like a sequel as opposed to a remake, mm-hmm. um, I need to go back and rewatch the first three. And so I went back and rewatched the first three and I actually fell in love with all three of the movies. Yep. Like they're all good movies. They're all great. And I was just too young to appreciate them before. Yeah, I had a similar experience where I grew up, I grew up, being around them, my family watched them, and it was something I remember those movies as a kid, but I didn't really get them. And I think it was when finally in college we actually watched them in film class. Um, I think all three of them we did, and we we yeah. used them at two for film class. And I was like, oh my god, these are great! They look way different than what I I remembered as a kid. So yeah, um, I don't know what I was picking up on as a kid. I mean, it, it's just a lot of driving, and I wasn't in the cars, and I guess at that point I wasn't into guys wearing leather yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, for as a kid, there's just not much interesting about it. I do remember as a kid thinking that Tina Turner was badass. Yeah, I did. I did pick up on on that much, but otherwise, it was just like whatever. Um, I remember liking Gyro Captain. At them, they're what? I just I remember really liking the Gyro Captain. That was the only thing I remembered as a kid. <laughs> he was my favorite. <laughs> But they're, they're great movies and they have like a, a great um, a great thread with Mad Max being like the, the very first Mad Max is like his origin story. You get to figure out why he's mad um, and what's going on there and, and what's happening in the city because it's not an, quite an, a post-apocalyptic world yet in the first movie. It's kind of more grounded. Mm-hmm. Um but then in the subsequent movies, it gets 
each gets more and more dystopian. Like you see the after effects of what happened in the first movie and the second, and it, you know, just continues with each movie. And so by the time you get to Thunderdome, it's just like all desert. Yeah. Um, and just brown and and gross and dirty dusty. Yeah. Um and so you kind of think like, okay, so they they've announced a, a new one. Where are they gonna go from here? And boy, did they pull it out of their ass and just like give us one of the best action movies ever. Like yeah. I, I'm I'm still jaw dropped at, at how great Fury Road is. And it's hard to think of a movie being good a movie that's in t- almost entirely in just a giant action scene. It just it's yeah. it's nonstop. There's no there's no there's very little quiet moments. It's just nonstop action, and it's a very hard movie to make. Very few directors can actually direct you know action scenes to begin with, but a whole movie that's an action scene is is something very difficult. Yeah, and we watch so many movies with action scenes that are just either ridiculous or boring or just not exciting um edited weird and it's just it's 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 hard to do and george miller managed to do that for an entire movie and it's fantastic well yeah he managed to do it because all of those things you just mentioned he's he takes care of them with precision Mm -hmm. like that's why everything works um this is a movie that could fury road is a movie that could easily have fallen apart if any of those things weren't like if you just if you look at the the just read a premise of it. Mm-hmm. The movie is either going to come across as boring or just like really cheesy or campy. Mm-hmm. Um, and even like watching the movie, a lot of the dialogue actually is yeah. pretty cheesy, mm-hmm. and pretty campy. But the reason that the movie works is because um, I feel like a lot of movies today have lost the art form of visual storytelling mm-hmm. of just like being being able to tell your story visually. So many um, directors now rely on their dialogue or on um, just general writing, which is, I mean, you want your movie to be well-written, but not everything has to be said. I mean, there's there's something about for it to be a visual medium Mm -hmm. and showing what you want Mm -hmm. the audience to know. And Mad Max Fury Road is one of those movies that the dialogue could be whatever it is, because if you turn the dialogue off, you can still follow it. The dialogue mm-hmm. really doesn't matter in this movie. Mm-hmm. It's an enhancement. It, it, it's a part of world building. But if you were to actually mute this movie, mm-hmm. you would still know what every character's action and responsibility and what's happening. Mm-hmm. Everything is so is is done with such precision, like the editing the cinematography everything is done specifically to tell a story visually and so it just lines up and everything else is a bonus yeah i agree i i think he uh, he did um you can tell this movie had a lot of care and it was it was planned out intensely yeah. they, they didn't just show up there's there's a lot of directors who kind of show up on the day and have some loose plan with their that and they figure it out on the day of and you can tell this movie was incredibly um, planned out and storyboarded and, and everything made sense pretty uh, they knew what they were going to do exactly for, b- before their, their shooting yeah so I guess this movie as early as 1995 George Miller was working on this movie yeah. that's, a, that's a full like 10 years before the movie actually was released um, so there's lots of, of pre-production and planning going on storyboards, character designs, this <clears throat> this book that that our friend Reed H. Cooper has been looking for, I think you finally found it. Um, this huge art book for this movie is so worth uh, looking into because there's there's just so much that went into this movie, and a lot of things change during production, so that it's not quite the same mm-hmm. by the time the the finished film is out. But it's an improvement, and it's all you know. You go through that process, and then by the time you get to the end you've got something really solid that you can hold on to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan said, Hardy, uh, Hardy and Theron said they didn't get along well be simply because they were not able to visualize what was happening and were super nervous about their performance but power through because they trusted their director. That makes sense. I mean, if, if the movie is if it's very well planned out, you're not going to have a lot of freedom. He's going to just tell you what you need to do exactly uh, and it, may, it might not make sense but um, 
Yeah. As long as the director knows what's happening. Um, and that's that also goes in in line with um, the visual storytelling because if the actors are just going by a script, not all of that is written out. Yeah. Or, or not written out in a way that you, um, as an actor, would be able to to translate to comprehend and then yeah. get back out as an actor. Yeah, yeah. You know? Because like if you look at Tom Hardy as Max, um, and even in the earlier Max movies, Max is a very quiet character. He doesn't have a lot of dialogue. Mm-mm. So everything that he's doing has to be, um, it still has to have an emotional resonance, but mm-hmm. it's all through physicality. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, of, Tom Hardy's best work in this is not delivering lines, but actually his facial expressions. Yeah, just reacting. You can tell what he's thinking, um, or his little quirks to show you that he is mad. He has a couple of little ticks that he yeah. does um and and all of that stuff as an actor i could see very easily if you don't have um the grounding around you because you're not sure exactly what you're doing then that could be very nerve-wracking mm-hmm. um but george miller is such a great director that you know especially also because most movies are shot out of um context mm-hmm. like they're doing this scene here and this scene here so you kind of have to go all over the place and as an actor if you're just physically doing it, then then you might not be able to wrap your head around what your character is doing in a moment. Yeah. But George Miller is such a strong director that he can guide them into exactly what he wants for this shot. Um, and, and there's so many shots where it's just like, uh, or so many sequences where there are so many like little shots, but every shot is so important. Mm-hmm. Like it's, Oh, I just, I, I, it's just mind blowing how well to put together this movie is. Yeah, and it was really good that they had that trust in him to do that. Um, and from yeah. what I, from what I read, from what I read, the the trust went back the other way too. Because apparently, when um, Furiosa, it was an original design, she was a little bit more feminine, and she had like long hair, and and um, and when Miller talked to Th- uh, Thero- uh, um, Charlie Theron about it. Um, she kind of pushed back and said, I don't really think that this is what she would look like. She's under there. She, she's like fixing cars and she's, you know, in this machine. She wouldn't yeah. have long hair. I think she should be shaved head. And George Miller fully ran with it. He's like, basically said, okay, I trust what you feel the character and, and basically we'll run with what you think would be. And, and this is why we got the Furiosa, Furiosa that we got. It was a lot of the Theron um, kind of wanting, kind of explaining what she thought the character would be like. And it helped. Yeah. And it's such a strong character, as a, especially um, when you have her juxtaposed with um, the wives that she's mm-hmm. constantly around, because they are that. They are like supermodel-esque mm-hmm. and all have long hair or or some kind of like sexy styled hair. Mm-hmm. And they that's what they would be because they're the, the women that um, the villain wants to look at and wants to, for lack of a better term, breed. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so they would be that type and that fits them perfectly. Um, but Furiosa is much more of a um, gritty character. Mm-hmm. She's not been, like the wives have been uh, housed and taken care of and you know made sure that they're kept um, clean for, for a Morton Joe. Yeah. Uh, where Furiosa, like you said, she would be working under a car. She's got... Uh, grease paint all over her face she's dirty she's missing an arm which is yeah. such an amazing um character point for me because we need more characters with um i'm going to put in quotes disabilities because even though she's in uh she's amputated she's still that doesn't hold her back but yeah. she's even more amazing because of it mm-hmm. and you know <laughs> there's there's so much about this movie and and I love that the movie is actually um the title of the movie is actually tied to Furiosa mm-hmm. being Fury Road because even though it's a Mad Max movie like all the Mad Max movies Mad Max himself as a character is just a conduit for every, to, the story for other yeah. stories for mm-hmm. other characters to tell their stories so really the true star of this movie is Fury Road mm-hmm. I can't even speak Furiosa like this is she's the star of the movie she's the movie the movie's like emotional heart Mm -hmm. um and I I just love that we got this this badass woman who's not 
cookie cutter. Like it, it took everyone's collaboration to, to create that. Yeah. Um, but Furiosa goes down with like Ripley as being one of the most badass women ever to be on the screen. Isn't Mad Max more more of a conceptual name to state post apocalyptic post apocalyptic Australia? No, Mad Max is his actual like Mad is specifically the madness of Max. Yeah, because his character is Max. Uh, Rocka Stansky, I think is his last name. It's wild. Um, but but the the entire movie and the entire franchise really because they are Australian films. George Miller's Australian director um, do have that zaniness that come with Australian movies because mm-hmm. Australian movies really get out there mm-hmm. um, in the best way. I love yeah. them. Uh, but it's. Reed H. Cooper's asking, but it, but he's just a catalyst character. Well, in the first movie, he's the star. The movie does revolve around him in the first movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the rest of the movies, he's he's a catalyst. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the, the first movie is like an origin story. We find out why Max is mad, um, which I don't want to spoil it for you if you've never seen it, but you guys should, you should, watch you should it. really see all of the movies. If you don't like Mel Gibson, I get it. Um, these are the only movies that I can actually look at and not see Mel Gibson for Mel Gibson. <laughs> like I am so into the franchise that I, he doesn't bother me in them. Also, um, he was younger, so he didn't quite look like the Mel Gibson that's in our brains now. Right, the, the, the older right. Mel Gibson, yeah. <laughs> he looks a little bit different. Yeah. I- cool. So do you want to talk about a little bit about the themes that, and some of the themes that kind of popped into my head and I think felt more more um relevant now for some reason that they did back then i don't know if it's just because i'm more aware more woke. no it, it definitely feels more relevant now so this movie came out in 2015 which was a full year before the 2016 elections um and yet we have this villain who is very trumpish yeah <laughs> it's, it's so wild um and it, it's what's really interesting is that uh, George Miller brought the villain from the original movie back, back for this. Yeah. Not, it's not the same character, but the same actor who played the villain in the original movie, um, who is I have his name right here, uh, Hugh Case Byrne. He played the the villain in the original movie. He's brought back to play Morton Joe. He's probably the like least known actor. Mm-hmm. Um, of all the big major players in this movie, but he's so good as a Morton Joe. It's such a unlikable character and at the same time, fascinating. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where a lot of people are with um, Trump, where it's just like, God, what a dick, but he's all over the news and people are still watching him and can't look away from him. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like what this character is. Uh, for me, the, the the themes that kind of jumped out at me is, is definitely very much the like um, uh, kind of where our capitalistic society stands right now in terms of of the 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 rich, the people who hold all the resources are the ones who are controlling everything and basically yes. and 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 controlling all of the rest of the humanity by just hoarding resources and and, yeah. and spe- specifically in our country is being money. And money is, is 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 being hoarded back by by a select few, um, and the rest of the rest of the, um, and not only just keeping it and hoarding it, but in, on the backs of the rest of the of, of the people. And there's a lot what what this movie had a lot to do to say about that about um, allowing just the few controlling all the resources and using them to yeah, control and people. It, and and it's funny that like a Morton Joe's resource is that he has water water yeah um that he's using to make sure uh other people don't i mean the movie starts out with him like giving a little bit of water to his followers Mm -hmm. and then taking it away and say saying don't get used to water um which is a weird thing to even start with because water is a natural resource that people live to need it's not something that you get used to you actually need it but he knows that so he's using it against you know everyone to keep his his tyranny afloat yeah i mean um, it's it's like resources like now that we have that are are in a modern society are necessities like a place to live 
um, right. education, access to education and things like that, that are necessities at this point in, in our society, but are, are being um, controlled by money and by capitalistic societies. Uh, and not, and not then, inherently just capitalistic societies, but irresponsible capitalism. Because you can have capitalism that works and it's fine if it's responsible, but the majority of how we function today is very irresponsible capitalism, which abuses. I think, I think that... Um we might disagree on that point, but that's a that's a different <laughs> that's conversation. Another political topic to talk about. Yeah, um, I don't I don't think capitalism should exist, but I'm not going to go off on that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's for our political uh, podcast. We're going to start. <laughs> but but within the context of the movie, like it's funny that the resources that obviously gasoline is a big resource because mm-hmm. everyone's driving to anywhere that they need to barter. Um, to get stuff otherwise they're you know just home so if you can't drive you can't really do shit in this world Mm -hmm. um but one of the other big resources like the two towns that are meeting up to help try to get furiosa are the the gas town Mm -hmm. and then the bullet farm Mm -hmm. so it's like bullets are a huge resource here Mm -hmm. because no one trusts anyone like this is the kind of dystopian world that that (laughs) we're leading to with you know the way people deal with guns and like hold these uh material items more precious than people's lives mm-hmm. um i just thought it was funny that that they decided to make bullets such a important resource in this world where it's like water gasoline bullets are the three huge things that everyone's fighting about in this movie um but then you also have like a morton joe who is using uh, his control of of the water in his little citadel yeah. to control all of his people, and yet you know it's it, for us looking in, it's a horrible thing. Mm-hmm. But for the people that are living there in citadel, that's what they've gotten used to, and they can't think of it otherwise. So they continue to let him be the leader. They yeah. don't try it's to the norm. overrun mm-hmm. him or anything. He's got these war boys that absolutely. Um, obsess over him and support him like to the point of sacrificing themselves for him um and yet they don't they don't get anything like they they're all sick and and kind of have these tumors all over them um they don't have any kind of great health and they don't have anything to look forward to except for living in Valhalla which is where he would take them in the afterlife uh, just, and so there's all this kind of brainwashing happening to mm-hmm. get everyone to follow him, yeah. which is horrible, but is very much like what is happening in the real world right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it it, it, it kind of uh, it resonated with me a whole bunch watching it now yeah. than it did five years ago. I was like, before I was like, whoa, it was a cool movie. Well, there's some themes there, and I didn't didn't really think about it, but now I was like, oh wow, there's a bunch of stuff in there that um really really um stuck out. Um, yeah, particularly the war boys is one of the things that like really stuck out because they are they're um they're living on an empty promise of 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 having something to die for that is worth something, but it's not. He it's literally the, you know one of the girls one of the mo- the mothers um calls them uh, fa- um battle fodder, battle fodder. and basically they're yeah. just there they're just there to die they're just there to to yeah. to, to keep his fight going. And then, exactly. and his lives matter nothing to him. I think that while while Charlie Theron as Furiosa is amazing, um, and she's clearly the 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 star of the movie, like she's the lead as far as I'm concerned. I think that for me, the strongest story arc in the whole movie is actually Nux. Yeah. Um, who is one? I just have, have to get this off my chest. I love him. Nicholas Holt as Nux is like one of my my huge movie crushes. Um, and it's not just because he looks awesome. He looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Like all the War Boys, the, the design of the War Boys is just so cool. Yeah. But um, for me, it's the personality. He really, um, I, th- I think that my my biggest attraction, what I look for most in a guy, which is how I ended up with Dave, mm-hmm. is... Um, a personality that I like to refer to as a rebel 
with a cause yeah. as opposed to a rebel without a cause. And that's exactly what Nux is. Um, at the beginning of the movie, he's one of the war boys that is, you know, just pushing forward to help uh, find Furiosa because he wants to do anything he can for Morton Joe. Yeah. Um, and he's just brainwashed and he's just like thinking on this one track mind. He actually goes through the whole like, when these war boys think that they're going to die, mm-hmm. they spray paint their mouth and they say, witness me so they can be witnessed dying. Someone can witness them um, pulling the ultimate sacrifice mm-hmm. so that they can then live on in Valhalla. These yeah. are, I mean, this is an action movie and yet these themes are major. These yeah. are major themes for an action movie. Um so he actually goes through all of that process because he thinks that he's about to die. He spray paints his mouth and he says, witness me. He asks uh, Tom Hardy, Mad Max, to witness him because none of the other war boys are around because he's pushed so far ahead of yeah. them in this this fight to be amazing for Morton Joe. Um, and then Max, like, totally throws all of it off. He hasn't had his... Um, what what is it that they say um i live i die i live again mm-hmm. um so he hasn't he hasn't died he's he wants to die so that he can live again and max just completely throws that off yeah um then nux ends up meeting the wives he gets entangled with with all of these stories all of these separate story arcs are amazing but then when they entangle and they start to affect each other and you see how like Mad Max and, and Furiosa don't trust anyone, but yet here they are beginning to trust each other. Mm-hmm. And Nux doesn't really trust any of them and wants to kill them. And yet he meets a, a wife, one of the wives who, um, you know, these war boys are asking to be witnessed. And this wife is probably the first person who actually looks at him and sees him. Yeah. In a way that every human wants to be seen like as a a creature that is deserving of being seen of deserving of attention um and so that really flicks a switch for him and you know he's been uh raised to have to sacrifice himself for something yeah by the end of the movie he realizes what the right thing is to sacrifice himself yeah. for and there's a huge change there's a huge shift and what he stands for and who he is and he's willing to do the right thing. And it's, yeah. it's just amazing. It brings tears to my eyes to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> he managed to get what he was looking for, which is a reason to live and die for. And like, yeah. and then he achieved that he was, he achieved and he got what he was looking for the most. And while he didn't ultimately live on to have a happy life, he lived the best life he could have ever left. Right. Lived he, up to that point. He's, He's still a, a, a sacrificial lamb, but yeah. like for what for what purpose is your life uh, worthy? Yeah, is, is kind of like what his story is. And yeah. at the, you guys have all seen this movie, so I'm just gonna spoil it. Like he does die, and and just before he sacrifices himself to make sure that Furiosa and the wives are able to continue on their path. Um, he he has that moment where he points out of his window because the wife that he's fallen in love with is moving on. He points at her and says, he whispers because she can't hear him. He says, witness me. And then you get a shot of her actually watching him die. And it's like, oh, it's just such great filmmaking. Mm-hmm. We don't get stuff like this anymore. Nope. <laughs> it's so perfect. Uh, one of my other favorite moments with Nux was, was earlier on the film movie when he, um, after... Um, when he's still trying to help um, uh, Immortal Joe, um, and he he has the the one of the wives, um, he has like a piece of her clothing worn, and he says, "Come, you know." He invites him to a truck to ride with him, and he like yeah. hangs out the truck and talks to him, and, and basically uh, Immortal Joe says, "Go get him," and I will, you know, I will, I will, I will um, walk into the hall myself, and and like yeah. it's this like look of just completely like he feels so honored, and it's so sad because it's 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 just bullshit coming out of, of immortal joe and yeah. and and he yeah. totally buys it and believes it and he, he's willing to give up his life but um and it's kind of you know that gets turned around by the end of the movie but um i yeah i, I do think that his arc was probably the best arc of anybody in the whole movie 
there's also the aspect too that um, I think is a, a great theory that Nux is, uh, when we first meet Nux, he's just a, a regular war boy like all the mm-hmm. rest of them. Um, but he's he's very sick. He's got these tumors on his neck. Um, but he's sick enough that he needs blood. Mm-hmm. And Mad Max becomes his blood bag. That's what, that's their relationship in the movies. Mm-hmm. That Max is literally his bag of blood mm-hmm. and then he's hooked up to Nux. Um, and I think it's interesting that Nux is the one to make this this change because he's hooked up to Max and he's um, Mad Max is, is considered as a blood bag is considered feral and savage. Mm-hmm. And they're supposed to have like, I, I guess, I mean, this, that's another thing that I love about this movie is that there's so much world building that's implied that it lets your imagination figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I think is wonderful, but um, there's the implication that Mad Max's blood is um, like, the cream of the crop. It's yeah. like the best blood that they don't get very often. And so for him to be hooked up to Nux and for that blood, um, the blood of this, this character who is, um, he's a, he's a hero, but he's not, he's not like trying to take the, the center stage away from his Furiosa or anything like that. He's a hero, but he's also a support. Um, for this, that blood specifically to be going into Nux, just as Nux is starting to make his change, just like the theory that, you know, the blood that's inside of you um, helps you dictate what is what is right. And so if if Mad Max is like the catalyst for, for everything that's happening, even though these other stories are more important than his, mm-hmm. then that's how he plays into Nux's um turnaround in a way which yeah. is kind of a, a cool idea also the fact that nux um ends up taking his uh boots yeah yeah and it's kind of like it's kind of like nux like like nux getting mad max's blood and and boots are kind of like him beginning to come back to humanity as opposed to being um like a a monstrous war boy mm-hmm. if that makes sense um it's there's so much symbol sim symbolism in this movie that like i said and it's all visual like you can mm-hmm. turn the movie off and still follow what's happening because of these details yeah uh vexper asked if, if we've ever played the mad max game i have not i have it and i played like maybe the first 15 minutes of it and i didn't play more but do you not I, like it or you just i got that movie during a rough time where i really wasn't feeling like playing video games but oh. I got it anyway so it wasn't that it was a bad game. I just haven't gone back to it. Um, yeah, I should try it now. I wasn't yeah. sure about it. I'll have to, I'll have to replay it. Um, and, and that was it. I yeah, also, I also wanted to talk about the wives specifically. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause one of the things I like about this movie is that it's, um, like I said earlier, it's a very, on its surface, it's a very simple movie. Like it's literally just the wives are trying to escape. Yeah. There's going to be some driving. There's going to be <laughs> lots of driving. It's just going to be lots and lots and lots of driving. People are chasing each other, um, and the, the wives have to overcome, you know, the obstacles. It's it's a very simple movie on the surface, yeah, yeah. but it's got all of these depths and details that that make it greater. Um, one thing I love about this movie is that it feels like even though it's sim- simple, it's also at the same time very melodramatic. And it feels almost like um almost like a like mythology, like mm-hmm. like something epic. Um it feels like like these are if we were to watch how gods would act in a modern world. Mm-hmm. This is kind of how it feels. So like them going through that snow, that um, not snowstorm, dust the storm sentence, yeah. at the beginning, that's something like out of an epic. It's just like you see Valkyries flying through the air. It's mm-hmm. just so over the top that um, it doesn't feel like they're still human and yeah. can survive in that kind of thing. That's what I mean. Um, and I think that the wives specifically, uh, uh, encapsulate this feeling of like mythology mm-hmm. because they each each of their wives feels sort of like they're a siren or, or an oracle or 
um, something larger than just a human. Um, yeah. And it, it, you know, it, it makes it, it makes them all the more perfect of a treasure to fight over. But at the same time, they still have humanity. They're still human people. They're more than just, you know, bodies. They yeah. still have, um, well-developed characters. Um, they, they each represent something different. Um, but I, I just love this idea of like, this is what like a modern Greek myth would be kind of thing. Uh, That's how this movie always felt yeah. to me. And I, I did really like that the wives that were presented as like different characters. Like, cause it would have been really easy to have them just be just hot girls in, in, in outfits. And then they're just instruments for the story, but they had each individual uh, wife kind of tell their own character and their own little stories within the, within the, within the whole movie. And I really appreciated right. that, that each one had a very clear different personality and how they managed to, uh, um, to go. And the wives are also like, in the last, you know, five years since this movie came out, all the wives have gone on to do like even better things. Mm. Um, so it's almost like, you know how you get those movies where it's like uh, the entire cast is, you know, you have no idea who this cast is, but in five years, they've all become like big names. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of how I feel like the wives are becoming. Like they're mm-hmm. not really huge, huge names yet, but they, they're they all actresses who have been doing great things since this. Like, for example, well, obviously one of the wives is Zoe Kravitz, yeah. who is Lenny Kravitz's daughter. She's going to be Catwoman in the Robert Pattinson Batman movie. Um, and she's been popping up doing things here and there. I think she was the voice of Mary Jane in Spider-Verse. Yes. Um, so she's been doing a lot. Then there's, um, Rally, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, actually. Rally Kyo, who is capable of the redhead who, um, is in a relationship or kind of like starts to bud with, uh, Nux. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's been actually doing a lot of stuff. She was just in The Lodge, oh, which okay. was not great, but <laughs> she was in it. <laughs> well, she got paid but, um, to show up. She got paid for it. Uh, She's she's been doing a lot of stuff. Yeah, uh, Rita Schuber says she was in X Men Origins too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and then I have to point out my favorite of the wives is um, uh, the Dag, who's played by Abby Lee. She's the really tall one with the long blonde hair, who's just kind of like slightly weird. Um, oh she yeah, was she's my great. Favorite muse already. Yes. What? She was great. She was real fun. Yeah, she's great. And she's a, she's the one that's like always yelling like slur words at people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you slanger or whatever <laughs> it is she says. Um, so she was already my favorite of the wives. And then um, the movie Neon Demon came out. And you guys know how much I love that movie. Mm-hmm. She's one of the villains in oh, Neon she? Demon. Oh. She's, yeah, she's amazing. I actually had to, I've drawn her a couple of times because I love that character, mm-hmm. her character in Neon Demon so much. Um, and then that new Lovecraft country that's coming out, mm-hmm. she's in. Oh, okay. Um, so I can't wait to see like what the rest what of does. these uh, wives get into because they all they're all great actresses. Like mm. even the smallest role in this movie is is put on by a great performer. Yeah. Um, so they, they're all worth continuing to watch their careers. Um, one of my favorite moments with uh, with her specifically was um, the fact that she inherited the bag of the of the of the older yes. lady which is cool because that old lady she was kind of the weird one of the group she was like doing things and had a little bag and and i love that she like when that lady died she took her bag and then inherited th- that that responsibility um which yeah. fit for her like it was i don't know it was very fitting for her to be the one to to be handed this responsibility that of, of this lady's bag let's talk about how great this movie is like as a feminist movie because the women Furiosa, the wives, and the um, the older women that they run into, mm-hmm. we get like such a broad range of women. Mm-hmm. Um, like we get young women, we get old women, we get softer women, we get women who are just hardcore badass. Mm-hmm. Like it's just so great to see um, so many strong women and women not be relegated to playing a specific role. Mm-hmm. Um, this this whole movie, there's this theme of how there is there is literally no survival uh in this world or in our world mm-hmm. um without women mm-hmm. like there's no women are are the mothers who create life 
women are the people who nurture life and make sure that you continue to live. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and they're so essential it's, that it's they're just, they're treated. They're so essential that they're treated as resources. Exactly. Exactly. Which is awful. But but, but that's how <laughs> but, important but they are. It makes the point for the movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, yeah, and yeah, I love the the whole idea of the the young wives being passed on because it's it's almost like all of the wives uh, match up with one of the older women mm-hmm. and they kind of pass on everything to the younger generation as yeah. they move on. Um, there's one point in the movie. I mean, because the movie starts out so you go into this movie thinking it's just going to be like so masculine like mm-hmm. a movie like mad max is just all about cars and driving and action it just sounds so masculine and then you get to a point where you look at the screen and there's like i don't know 15 characters on screen and the only two male characters are max and nux yep and it's kind of amazing it's just mm-hmm. like this is awesome <laughs> we need more of this yeah i mean and ultimately the movie was about femininity and like creating and, you know, it, as opposed to like what masculine normally means is destructive and, 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 and getting that it was attaining that femininity and becoming a, a better society, um, which I think would have made more sense to have all these females being and being a, the heroes basically of, of the story. Right. Um, I love the, since, since we're, you know, spoiling whatever, one of my favorite shots of the movie is literally the last one where we get um, Furiosa on the lift Mm-hmm. And she's looking out at Max and sh- and it's just being lifted. And it's like, yes, <laughs> raise the women. Women <laughs> women can rule this. Like, they're going to be it fine. It doesn't have to be the same old white guys doing the same old thing. Yeah. Um, it just disappears into that, the crowd. Yeah. And I, th- I think that um, and Mad Max is in the crowd and he's kind of just walking away yeah. because he doesn't, you know, it's not his story. He's not the 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 guy that you're rooting for at the mm-hmm. end it's furiosa and he's moving on to the next story mm-hmm. um <clears throat> i think that another thing that's very relevant right now uh with this movie that's even more relevant now than it was then because it's become such a a hot topic thing is the the whole women's movement and the idea of of you know hashtag me too and also the idea of resistance Mm -hmm. um because uh one important aspect of this movie is you know furiosa has um taken the wives rescued the wives so that they can go find this this green place that's supposed to be perfect and heavenly and they can survive there and then they get there and realize that it no longer exists um and so a big part of this movie is about not having to run away from something, but actually having to stand and fight where you are Mm -hmm. because they go back to where they came from and they, you know, on the way back, they have to fight. And the spot where they were was good already. It's Mm -hmm. just a matter of fighting for it. Yeah. Um, So I I think that that lends itself very heavily to the whole idea of resist, um, not, running away from something but just you know actively fighting fighting back yeah. what's right here in front of you um and being able to overcome it yeah because a lot of people don't quite understand that or it's not we're told basically because of who controls society we're told not to resist we're told just go with the flow it, whether right. it's by force or by shame like oh it's it's easier if you just don't it's it, people get into that that the mentality of like no it's just easier if i don't say anything or i don't do anything yeah. i don't want to and so having yeah have, teaching these characters these characters figuring out that they, that's what they have to do um i think it's a good message we even get one of the wives who is nervous about the whole thing who wants to go back like she sees a chance to yeah. run back to a morton joe because it's not an easy thing to do Mm-mm. um and the movie isn't trying to say that it's a rough thing. I mean, you see Furiosa at the end of the movie and she's been through hell and she's not looking very pretty and it's fine. Like it's okay not to look pretty. You still won. You still a badass. Um, yeah. but yeah, we do get a wife who, you know, wants to run back and you have to, you know, show them that that's not the way that's going to be helpful to you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the the heavy use of practical effects in this movie. That got a lot of attention when this yes. movie came out. So when this movie came out, they got a lot of attention because they were using. I mean, they built all the cars that they use. They shot everything practically, um, um, and they did so much other stunts and everything happened. I think it was. It got a little weirdly unfair in terms of CG because we were saying, "Oh my God, this is what movie should be built. It should be filmed like, and you know, we shouldn't be using CG." And then they they. If you watch the movie, or if you were yeah, if you were paying attention, CG. there's a ton of CG. There is, CG. <laughs> there is a a large amount of CG, but with the way they did it correctly is the fact that they they built as, and did as much as they could physically, and then used the CG to enhance around. There is a ton of yeah. CG, but it was used to in in, in enhancing uh, the situations that were happening because the, and there's a lot of movies who would have the same kind of level of. Um, of action scenes and things like that, that, that some of us just do it entirely in CG. Some of the entire car chases are done in CG. Um, yeah. And, and it, but the fact that they did so much of this in, 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 in practically, it was fantastic. It looked really good and it made a big difference in, in how much you believed and how much you were engaged with the movie. I mean, something like that dust storm is not, they're not, not going to happen. Filming that. No. <laughs> like they, that, that definitely has some CG help, but then you get, um scenes like and this isn't a, a car chase scene because they did do a lot of mm-hmm. uh the the cars practically but you get that fight scene between um max and furiosa when they first meet um and nux with the the car door stuck on them and mm-hmm. all of that um and it's all stunt work it's all mm-hmm. choreography and i think that that that's a smaller scene because it's just them fighting but i think that that idea of of Let's actually do this. Let's choreograph this. Mm-hmm. Let's get it again. I'm going to use the word precision. Mm-hmm. Um, let's make everything precise so that uh, when we do go into post production, it's easier to just, um, you know, embellish a little embellish bit to add yeah. some some spice to to this movie magic or whatever. Um, it's the same idea with the car chase scenes. They mm-hmm. did a lot of the car chase scenes, driving and stunt work on the cars. Um, and then there's just like a little bit of, of embellishment to make it, like I said, it feels like an epic. It feels kind mm-hmm. of otherworldly. And so they need special effects for that to happen. Yeah, I mean, um, in, in some of the effects that they did, there's, they added cars in certain situations. They added maybe some of the cars on the sides were added. Yeah. They, added a, they added dust to the situation where it already had dust. They just embellished on it uh, right. and just kind of made, made took scenes that existed and just made it bigger. Um, yeah. and, and and the stunt work, I still can't believe that there is not a stunt category for, yeah. <laughs> for Oscars. Because just looking at a movie like Mad Max, it's like, how do you not acknowledge the work that went into this mm-hmm. by all the people who, I mean, everyone is full throttle. There's no half-assing mm-hmm. anything in this movie. Um, and it's, just looking at it is tiring. I can't imagine <laughs> doing all the stuff that those people did. Um, one of the cool things in the stunt work and a lot of the ac- basically all action that's happening in the movie that George Miller did really well and I, it, it may, you may not have noticed it but if you not you specifically I mean the world um, if you guys go watch a movie and you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it recently you go watch it again um, a lot of, the majority of the action or if not all the action happens in the center of the frame so I that, knew you were gonna say that so yeah so so that when when there, all these quick cuts keep happening your eye is just locked in that center of the end and you don't at center of the frame and you don't miss anything. There's a lot of movies that don't really quite do that. And you, especially in, in a movie screen, you're looking left, you're looking right and you kind of lose track of everything that's happening. But in this movie, it, when there's quick, quiet, it, it, it particularly happens in that scene that you were just talking about Furious uh, and, and, um, and Mad Max are fighting. It, there's a ton of quick cuts and there's a bunch of action happening, but it's always in the center of the frame and you know, you always know exactly what's happening. Um, and that was such a like, important idea and, a, and a process to have in this movie to, for it to make sense. Yeah. That, again, like it's a very precise decision to make so that when you're watching the movie, mm-hmm. um, you don't have to, your brain doesn't have to work to find the focal point. The focal point is right in front of you always. Mm-hmm. So your brain instead becomes more invested in what's happening in the focal point as opposed to looking for it. And it just makes everything feel that much um, bigger and more important. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Agreed. Um, Another thing that that really adds to the movie and it's um, crazy, crazy, crazy feel is the music. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's got this this brash soundtrack that actually. I, I remember writing a review for this movie when I first saw it. I saw I actually saw it a couple of days before it it came out, before it hit theaters, because I went to an early screening thanks to um, a friend, a mutual friend that we have. I think you know her because she used to work at Disney. Um, but she was working on the the marketing for this movie and was like, "I know you're excited for this, so come to the screening." And I was like, "Hell yeah!" <laughs> Um, so I ended up writing a review for it, like the night that I saw it before it even came out. Um, and one of the things I remember putting in my review was that the sound of this movie, like that, just the harshness of it, whether it's the, the score, like banging or the, the sound of, of explosions or cars, the sound of rust, like mm-hmm. brushing against each other is just like, out of this world. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's so genius to have um, basically the equivalent of like, I feel like we don't use MP3 players as much now. We just use our phones. But at the time, I I think MP3 players were still kind of the thing uh, to carry around. And we basically have like the equivalent of carrying an MP3 player on a drive with us. In this character named Doof, who's mm-hmm. like got his own car, and he's literally bringing war drums and playing music for the War Boys. Um, it's it's, <laughs> it's a brilliant idea to just have like literally a car just for music. The music, These yeah. Huge speakers, and then um, uh, the character Doof was played by a singer named um, Iota, who mm-hmm. is I, I guess he's. Uh, a huge guy in Australia. So it was like a whole meta music thing. Um, that's right. Somebody gave me a CD of it. Yeah. It's, oh, you have a CD of this? Yeah. Oh, that. So that's, that's who plays Iota in the Dave's working behind me in case you guys couldn't <laughs> see him. Um, that's who, you know, Iota plays the Doof Warrior in this movie. Um, and apparently, Art, you found an article this week that was talking about how that character was almost cut from the movie. Yeah, it was almost cut from the movie because uh, people reacted poorly to him uh, in early screenings. You know, movies often do early screenings to kind of figure things out and, and, and tighten things uh, because the soundtrack wasn't completed. So there was this, I guess they kept reusing this one riff over, like he would, it was oh. just playing over, over again. And it, yeah. so the character didn't didn't read properly with audiences. It almost got cut. Um, last minute, they decided to keep in it and, and put in the proper music. And then I think that, that helped them become a little bit more powerful and I mean, as you watch it now, he's very interesting to watch, and he's a very cool, interesting character in the in the, in the whole movie. Yeah, I mean, he's he's kind of just like an Easter egg. If yeah. he wasn't there, nothing plot wise would change Mm-mm. the movie. But the fact that he, that he is there, and there is such a thing as this car carrying the war drums mm-hmm. and this guy. I mean, he's literally like swinging around while playing a mm-hmm. guitar from the car. Um, it it just adds to the the manicness of this world. It's a part of the world building that's kind of incredible. Um, but I can totally see how if it did not have the right music, like the music would actually make or break this character. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad the music. This the score was done by Junkie XL, who is a electronic artist that I liked already. Um, and I love it when when like. Uh, <laughs> I call it secular music because <laughs> scores for me are like religious music. Yeah. <laughs> but when a, a secular artist, like a, a someone who doesn't normally do film scores, moves over into doing film scores and they just like knock it out of the mm. park. And this is one of them that I was very proud of that, that he moved into scoring movies. I really liked how that idea of having the, 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 the music truck or whatever kind of helped to bring the score into the movie and because it like yeah. the the score went in and out of the these these war drums uh seamlessly and it was really great to see that um not a lot of movies are able to integrate their their score into the actual story and it was really cool um, to see that happen there right and then we get you know the the feeling that we get from hearing the war drums just enhances the feeling that we were seeing the war boys get from hearing the war drums. Mm-hmm. Cause that's why those war drums are there to like really hype up. It's like, like I said, if you have, um, if you're going for a drive and you put on like a song that really hypes you up so you can just enjoy your drive. That's literally what this is. It's like having your MP3 player. Yeah. Um, the war boys, you just see them 
get so hyped and ready to do a Morton Joe's bidding. Mm-hmm. And it's completely understandable. Like it's, it's a part of their brainwashing. So it's, it's, I'm glad that it wasn't taken out of the movie because it's a huge part of the world building. Um, Harlan says, I don't know. They picked La La Land for best picture. Oh wait, I mean Moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> we still have this to do is, our La La Land episode. <laughs> yeah, we have to do a La La Land episode. <laughs> I don't remember offhand how many action movies have actually been nominated for Best Picture, uh-uh. but this one—I mean, this is a this is a very deep genre movie uh-huh. that got nominated for Best Picture. And we always talk about how genre movies don't really get nominated uh-uh. for Best Picture, but this one did. It didn't win. Didn't win. But but still, it was one of ten. It was yeah. It was that year where they they started doing that. Huh? I hate the, the ten. I hate the ten. <laughs> it's like participation trophies. <laughs> it's kind of like what it is, which is upsetting. <laughs> Reed H. Cooper says, "Don't I like you? Don't make me sad." <laughs> you you Lala fan, Lala Land fan. Is that what's happening? <laughs> Reed H. Cooper, you know how we feel about La La Land around here. <laughs> this is nothing new. <laughs> We'll do our episode, and then you'll see what we mean. You don't have to agree with it, but we'll uh, we'll let you know. It's okay; we can disagree. Sure. Will and I disagree all the time. He almost went on a rant earlier about something he disagreed with That's me. That's true. That's fine. Um. Yeah, I love this movie. If you guys haven't watched Mad Max in a while, go watch it. Yeah, because it's. It holds up. I yeah. mean, it's only been five years. It's not going to outdate itself yet, but it's still so strong. I I was telling Art that I watched the movie last night, and I mean, you guys see, I keep wiping my eye. I get teary eyed just talking about it. But watching it again last night, um, I actually started to like full on cry watching Mad Max Fury Road, <laughs> and not because. It was like an emotional scene where I was just invested in the characters. I'm I literally started crying because of how great the filmmaking is. Yeah. It's that kind of movie for me. <clears throat> it's one of the few movies that I've given five stars to. Like just flat out. Five stars. Uh there was one there's one woman in the movie where when the first time I saw it, I hated. Hated. And I thought it was the opposite of good filmmaking. Watching it really? now, I want to hear what this moment is because I I can't think of anything that's bad. With it. Watching it now, I think I'm I'm extremely amused by it, and I think I think I was wrong to have hated it in the first place. Um, it, it's something you're amused by because the the movie is very tongue in cheek. It's, yeah, it's got a silliness to it. So there's that moment where the where the 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 the, the music truck explodes at the end of the movie. Yeah, and then and, and the guitar goes. <laughs> into oh, the camera the slow motion and then, CG stuff. and then the like the the wheel goes up to the camera it's very like 80s 3d because the movie was yeah, released in yeah, 3d yeah. and i remember hating that so much i thought it was like it's so stupid this is very like 80s cheesy 3d and then watching it now like it, i it made me realize that it was done on purpose and it was almost like poking fun at the idea of 3d because it was shot in 3d and it looked great in 3d but the, the it was it was it wasn't a, a way to impress you. It was just it was just kind of comment, a slight offhand comment, and 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 almost poking fun at the idea of three D and, and movies and stuff. So I, I thought it was kind of funny. Now when I realized now that it was more purposeful than I thought it was. Um, yeah, because the, the movie came out in three D, yeah. but there's it's not. It's not 3D in the way, in the sense that we normally think of 3D with things like that. That's the only time in the movie that we really get something specifically shooting out at you in that that stupid 3D way. Um, so it is kind of like a tongue-in-cheek thing. I think the reason that that stands out more so than being that kind of um, old-school 3D style, I think it stands out because... Um, it's so CG mm-hmm. where most of it is practical. That's probably like the biggest CG shot in the film. Yeah. Um, that That's like noticeably, noticeably CG. There yeah. are others, obviously, but that one is like noticeable, noticeably CG. Um, and I think it stands out because of that. Um, but I never, I've heard other people actually say they hate that shot. I've never hated that shot. I've always thought it was kind of like an exclamation point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where it's it's like 
everything leading up to that point is so melodramatic um, and so like intense and harsh. Um, and that's the point where that's literally Nux's sacrifice. Um, so everything has led up to that. And we've just had like a really like, oh, fuck, Nux just sacrificed himself and we're about to lose it. Mm-hmm. And then that happens. And it's kind of like the big exclamation point. And then right after that is like Furiosa's um, uh, Max and Furiosa have their moment together. That's very soft and slow and quiet. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's almost like that shot is this is the end of the intensity. Mm-hmm. You can relax now. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it kind of it kind of brings you out of it. So it, it's still like great filmmaking. I can't fault it. It's, yeah. it's there for a purpose. Yeah. Now I get, I feel that now it's just the first time I, I, I my first watchings of movies are usually pretty um, reactionary. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I felt I, like that. I, I have that feeling too. I react so to a lot like. of movies. And then I go back, you know what I watched? I mean, slightly off topic, although this is still a feminist movie. You know what I rewatched recently that I absolutely loved so much more than I did the first time I watched it? What's that? Captain Marvel. Really? Yeah. Huh. Dave and I rewatched it. Or I rewatched it. Dave watched it for the first time, and we both liked it a lot. Um, And I liked Brie Larson... um, as Captain Marvel a lot more this watching than I did the first time. Should I watch it again then? Yes, you should. Okay. I'm going to watch it again. I think that, I think that there was so much going on with that movie in the media Mm -hmm. when it came out that I think a lot of people went into it already seeing Brie Larson as a cardboard box and just kind of like focused on that. Yeah. But there's actually a lot, she does a lot of, um, subtle acting in it that's really great and she's having fun the whole time it's not really as stuffy as i felt the first time okay she's actually enjoying it the whole time her relationship and how she plays off with sam jackson is really great Mm -hmm. um but enough about that i just it it just struck me that that was a better movie the second time than first. what was the movie that we compared it to i forget alita alita that's right battle angel no, but there was something where we there was another movie where we said it was um we liked it as much as this movie. Oh, it was it was Dark Phoenix. Dark Phoenix, that's right. Because that's the plots are basically the same. Uh-huh. I mean, the characters are are very similar um and how things play out are basically the same, but I think Captain Marvel is has a slight yeah. advantage over it. Okay. I might watch it then. Um I want to address a couple of comments here in the in the in the chat. So speaking about movie action movies not being nominated, Harlan said, depends on how you define action movies. 1917, Dunkirk, and Hawksaw Ridge were nominated. I think um, the difference is, is that um, primarily uh, action-heavy, I think is what we're talking about. They're specifically, um, I think those movies, Dunkirk and Hawksaw Ridge, were primarily dramas with action in them as opposed to a movie and that... Also, is, also historical dramas, which yeah. the Academy loves yeah. historical dramas. Uh, but I would talk. I think we're t- when we're defining action movies, we're talking about movies that are heavily and primarily action movies, um, and it's it, it, it's maybe not a clean cookie cutter kind of description, but it's it's just kind of like a uh, movies that are not don't fall into the categories that are like historical dramas or big dramas and things like that. For example, like the the crowd that would rush to see Mad Max Fury Road in a the theater is probably a similar crowd that would rush to see, I mean, in its first, you know, when it's first released, now that it's got all this acclaimed, I think everyone will rush to see it. But when it first came out, it's probably the same crowd that would have rushed to see like a Fast and the Furious movie, Mm -hmm. um, which is not quite the same crowd. I'm sure there's some overlap, but not quite the same crowd as 1917 or Dunkirk. Yeah. If that makes sense. um, And I think that's what we're talking about in terms of like, what kind of movies the Academy thinks are cool? Um, and Vesper said earlier, they, they said, going back to the stunt, stuntman being uh, and the Academy, uh, wouldn't it be awkward to have one give one stuntman more credit than another, considering they're both worked the butt off and potentially risk their health? Yes, but um, I think we're, when in dealing with stuntman not being, it's it's stuntman not being recognized at all, is is I think what the issue is with the Academy. Um, but and I, I do also think that if they were at a stunt 
category was going to be included in the Academy. I don't think it would go to an individual stuntman. It would probably go to stuntman teams or stuntman coordinator yeah, for a movie. Uh, that's what I was going to say, because then you get something like best visual effects and it goes to the house that does yeah. the visual it goes, works or, or just a visual effects production team as opposed yeah. to an individual like CG animator or something yeah. like that. And I think it would go to probably to stunt coordinator, which would, would then be representing his entire team. Um, yeah. And I think, and I, th- I think dealing with some of those, with those, st- I think the stuntmen would rather not be spit individually recognized, but to be recognized as a group, uh, they would very much want that. And I think that's that's the least that the, the academy should be doing, because they're an essential part of filmmaking. Yes, I agree. Uh, British Cooper says, "Is Brie Larson not a cardboard box in the way that Kristen Stewart is actually not boring? I honestly don't think she's boring. She's too hot to be boring." <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Know. Um, I I will take. I still have not gotten on the Kristen Stewart bandwagon. There's so I know so many people who just like love her work, um, and it, it's funny because you know her and Robert Pattinson coming both coming out of Twilight. Um, I really wasn't a fan of either one of them, and then one of them has proven in their work that you know he's a great actor and i enjoy his work and i have watched i've literally w- tried to watch stewart movies and get into her and i just <laughs> there's nothing about her that that commands me or keeps my attention um, I, I i would take Brie larson over stewart any day <laughs> i didn't i didn't i didn't i didn't like i'm not that i've watched them all as a whole i've seen chunks of them in twilight movies i don't like kristen stewart in them but i don't maybe that's not her fault um but i've seen her in other things and i like her i thought she was I thought she was fine. I like her. Not like a huge fan of her, but I like her. The times that in other things that I've seen her, I've enjoyed her. And and I think it's Twilight I've not enjoyed just because it's Twilight. What's Twilight? Says Rudy <laughs> It's okay. Don't worry um, about it. She just seems so sleepy to me. And there's, there's, I mean, there are, I can't speak. There are other movies that she's in that I um, am willing to watch. Like she, her being in a movie isn't doesn't mean that I'm not going to watch it. Um, like the movie Underwater, I keep hearing good things about, so yeah. I want to see it. Um, but I, I literally can't think of there are there are certain actresses who, uh, when I think of their names, I just think of great performances, and I can't think of off the top of my head like tons of movies that they're in, like that I love and where mm-hmm. they are the thing that brings me to seeing that movie um and she's just not one of them yeah i don't think she's had that yet i don't think she's had something that but 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 she has for other people there are lots of people who go see movies just for her she's a draw for some people and that's fine for for them but i i I can't do it (laughs) (laughs) i i literally tried to watch personal shopper um because it's a i knew it was a ghost movie Uh um that was slightly art house and both of those things are like win-win for me i love horror and if you make it an art house horror that's like pretentious i'm like okay i can do that i love it um but but she's so sleepy in it she's just so that's all i get from her is sleepy i just feel like she wants to go to sleep all the time i don't get any other emotion from her ever um and that's why i i literally think that her best role was in panic room when she was in a diabetic coma. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I've said that I, before, but I, I, watched, I can't. I can't, I just can't get into her. I watched um, what's that movie? Uh, Cafe something. Woody Allen movie. A few years back. Oh God. Cafe something. <laughs> See, I know. I know. I know you have. She won't keep me away from. She won't keep me away from seeing a movie. But if you say it's a Woody, <laughs> Woody Allen movie, no, I'm I know. I knew this. I knew. Th- I knew this was going to be an issue. But I w- <laughs> checked out. It just hurt. I, I do want to see. I'm, I want to see Underwater, and if she's great in Underwater, then yeah. I'm more than happy to say, oh, she was great in that. Yeah, and when I saw it, and I thought she was charming in that, I was like, I was like, okay, it worked for in this movie. She worked for me. Um, yeah. yeah. And see, that's different. That's a different thing. There are some people who can be fit into any movie because they're so great. There are some people who you make a movie around and make a movie that they fit in, and that's great, too. Um, I don't think that... that I think that movies have to be made around her. Yeah, she well, she's <laughs> she's definitely like like she's got a specific style and a specific personality that doesn't reach for everybody in every role. You're right. Yeah. She's not she's not an she can't fit into everything, and right. I get it because she she's she's got a little bit of a 
kind of strange or mellow personality that works for some people and it works. And I think yeah. for her, it's just a matter of taste. I don't think there's an empirical she's bad or she's good. She's definitely one I of those people that, that are just taste. I, I don't know how we got off on this. I tangent. have no idea how we got <laughs> but, off this tangent. But one, one last thing about it. I think that if she um, chose better roles for herself, that it, sh- it could it could work. It could work, yeah. Because I, I feel like someone else that I would say is kind of a sleepy actor is Keanu Reeves. And he, like, Keanu Reeves is so laid back and just always, like, you know, chill. Um, but he finds movies that he works in. Yeah. And he's fine. Yeah. So She's I don't mean, I don't, when I say sleepy, I don't mean to say it as a deterrent or, that, no. you know. Just her style. She's awful. It's just... How how she comes off? Uh, Vexper says, "Is it bad to still view Brie Larson as Envy Adams from Scott Pilgrim?" No, that's still in my head. I can't get that out of my head either. <laughs> um, no, cool. I'm after watching Captain Marvel again. I'm excited to see what else she does with that character in future Marvel movies. Cool. All right. Well, uh, do you want to move on to recommendations? Yes, I actually do have a, do a recommendation have. All right, let's already. See. Go for it. Um, because it ties into our topic of the of the day. Ew. If you guys have not gone onto YouTube and watched any of the movies with Mikey videos, oh yeah, that's what I recommend. There, um, there's a series of of film essays uh, done for the Film Joy uh, YouTube account. <clears throat> called Movies with Mikey, and he has one specifically. They're all great. Like, find your favorite movie and watch him talk about them. But he has one specifically that is about Fury Road, and I highly recommend you guys watch it because I get, like I said, I got teary-eyed watching the movie last night. (laughs) But I I have gotten teary-eyed just watching him talk about Fury Road because he analyzes analyzes, analyzes it so well. Um... So that's my recommendation. Go check out Movies with Mikey on YouTube. Cool. And I'm going to second that because I don't have anything this week because nothing new has happened to me this week. <laughs> what have you been watching lately? What's great that you've that Well, you I'm on like my 35th viewing of The Office. Um, <laughs> uh, we've been watching about six hours a day of Animal Crossing content on YouTube. Oh, um geez. Um, and that's about it. I haven't been watching you, a whole lot of you're stuff. You're playing Animal Crossing too, right? It's not just Amber. Yeah, it is me. It is me. Yeah. Amber's definitely playing Animal Crossing way more than I am, but we both are. I assume so, but you're but you're also playing. Ooh, um, if you guys have, I have a small recommendation. That's another YouTuber you can watch on YouTube. If you guys haven't watched watched the episode of Parks and Rec that they released, they did a they did a a, a virtual like a quarantine episode and it's really funny and it's really cool and i really liked it and they all shot it in their own homes and they made it work as an episode and it's really cool so if you're a fan of parks and rec and you haven't checked and if you're a fan of parks and rec i'm sure you've already watched it so i don't know why i'm recommending it uh readish cooper says scoob solar opposites on hulu run on hbo upload on amazon prime i do want to see scoob i haven't i haven't watched it <laughs> yeah readish cooper has been also- very excited about scoob i know Vexper also says um, they will always recommend the cult classic movie The Stuff, which is if you've not seen The Stuff, Mm-mm. please go watch it. That's okay. an entertaining movie. The Stuff. Okay. <laughs> I actually worked The Stuff into one of my comics, a little Easter egg. I love that movie too. Tarantula wants to watch Scoob and Trolls. I want to see Upload. Uh, on it seemed interesting. Which also, movie? Upload. Oh, Upload. Okay. Yeah. So cool cool all right well thank you so much for joining us and for being patient with our technical issues that put us an hour late into this and i'm really bummed out because today was finally when i got some cool social media stuff going and i'm working on it and it was like it didn't matter <laughs> somebody never saw it and it was clicked and it was like there's nothing here but i'm glad that that we got um the social media stuff going right on, yeah keep that going um and we're also getting more episodes up on youtube it was a yes. the popcorn one went up this weekend and there's a frozen one that still needs to go up yeah so, so um that will be up soon in the meantime i'm going to concentrate on uploading these episodes that are happening now because i feel like Good. i was getting a little overwhelmed trying to find because so okay so one of the things that happened is that i've been jumping around computers for the last couple of months because of quarantine and i've been like trying to hunt where those episodes went as we recorded them so that's been my issue of trying to gather them all so uh, and it's got a it got a little overwhelming 
among the other 300 things that I'm trying to do in a week. So I think yeah, you guys as, as a studio have been really knocking it out of the park. Y'all have a lot of content uh, going on right thanks. now. Thanks. He has a lot of going on. So I think my, I'm going to concentrate to make sure these go up so that I don't end up backing myself up further. Um, yeah. So actually last week's episode is probably go up tonight or tomorrow morning. And then this episode will go live on Thursday. Um, so I'm going to schedule it for Thursday release, by the way, when I, upload. <clears throat> okay, that sounds awesome. And if you're watching it on YouTube right now, then it is Thursday and it's or already after. happened. So ignore this part <laughs> of the, of the show. Um, yeah. So make sure you guys come back. Um, well, we will be back tomorrow with Solon's legacy and, uh, and maybe some random other streams that might happen. Uh, make sure to, uh, join our discord. If you're not, I'm sure you guys are, cause you guys are always here and we appreciate it but <laughs> well, i'm gonna I put mean, it in there you could be talking to people on youtube now so oh can yeah join the, discord. join the discord uh i'm gonna go ahead and 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 and, and raid our friends at skeby rooster but um yeah to angela discord is great you should join it it's really easy um you can learn a lot about animal crossing there we have a lot of friends at animal crossing there and uh just join it it's fun all right uh thank you so much for joining you guys we will see you next week I did it again. Why do I can't I get this through this properly? Thank you so much for being here, and we will cinephile you later. later. <laughs>